After years of study, Darwin's ideas transformed how we view the natural world. Let's talk about his main hypotheses and contributions to evolutionary biology. Darwin proposed several hypotheses for how the diversity of life on Earth came to be. These three hypotheses are common descent, descent with modification, and last but certainly not least, natural selection. Let's talk about these one at a time. First off, we have common descent. Common descent is the idea that organisms are similar because they share features from a recent common ancestor. In this graphic here, we're looking at different types of canids or different types of dogs. We have dogs and wolves, coyotes, all of them look pretty similar because they have a recent common ancestor. And the more closely related organisms are, the more similar they will be. If you take this back far enough, this also um, suggests that all living things have a common ancestor. Since this was first proposed, scientists have been trying to see if this holds up, and yes, it does. So far, there is evidence that was, there was a single origin for all life on Earth, though you do have to go back pretty darn far. Let's read one of my favorite quotes from Darwin. Therefore, I should infer from analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this Earth have descended from some one primordial form into which life was first breathed. Darwin is so quotable, but this is a beautiful way to describe that we do have one single origin of life based on this theory of common descent. And no matter how many different species we have discovered, when we all compare them, we do find evidence of a single common ancestor. We of course like to argue exactly how these species are related, but so far we do not find any type of life which is so different that we think it had a different origin. Common descent also predicts fundamental similarities between all living things. We find this in a couple different ways. First is the genetic code. It is almost universal, but there are a few groups of life that have modified it a little bit, which in itself is really interesting to look at how these fundamental similarities can be modified later on. Um, we also see a common set of vital proteins. These are mostly related to basic cellular function because we all have cells as our um, unit of unit of life. So, and they all have common needs. The one pictured here is RNA polymerase. You'll see it's slightly modified in different forms, but it is broadly similar. And you'll find other sets of common proteins with similar features like this. Our next theory is descent with modification. So now, rather than looking at common organisms and kind of looking backwards, now we're going to look forwards with descent with modification. Now this is the idea that characteristics of a species can change over time. In our example here, our first generation of ladybugs, they are all very dark. In our second generation, we start to introduce a few which have a slight more red in them. And as those generations go on, we have more and more red pigmentation, eventually to where we end up with red ladybugs with black spots. But you can see this happened gradually. This doesn't always happen all at once. Especially when you're looking at evolution really close, you're gonna be able to see those stepwise patterns for where one form started here and transformed into something after multiple generations. This hypothesis also shows that descendants of a single species can have different, different appearances. So now let's think back to that ancestral finch. The Galapagos Islands are not close to South America. It's actually really hard for birds to get there because it's just a little bit too far for most birds to be able to fly there safely. So what probably happened is an ancestral finch may have blown there by accident, possibly due to a storm, and ended up stranded on the Galapagos Islands. But since it was probably the first bird species to arrive, that meant it had no competitors. And then it diversified into many, many descendants who looked very different from each other because they all chose a different ecological niche to specialize in. Um, when we do find big enough changes, as we're seeing here with our finches, that's when we call it speciation. 
This is especially good for looking at the fossil record because now we can see how things change over time and we can track that descent with modification. Here, we're looking at horses. At the bottom, we have the ancestral horse. They're actually pretty small and you notice they started out with five digits just like we did. Um, as you can see over time, they gradually got bigger and they actually started to lose the digits in their feet. Um, and now they're really balancing on a single finger, which is elongated. So it's really like balancing on their toes, which works for them, but it would be a little bit awkward for us. The other one here, we're looking at the des descent with modification of whales from a tetrapod land dwelling ancestor who went back into the ocean. So you can see we have this gradual modification where they are losing their limbs and gaining more flipper-like appendages um, and having a stronger tail. Um, some specific uh, examples of descent with modification can be called adaptive radiation. This is another term we get from Darwin. Seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. Of course, here Darwin is describing the adaptive radiation he witnessed in the Galapagos finches. We have, of course, gone back and done more modern studies on them, and here is a tree of how we think these different species are related. Um, and adaptive radiation is the word we use to describe the diversification from a single founding species into many different species, occupying different niches. We generally find this in islands or in other instances where a new environment forms and nothing has um, evolved there yet. Let's now talk about Darwin's last hypothesis, natural selection. This one is a little bit more involved, so we want to talk about a couple observations leading up to natural selection to help us understand what's going on. First, there is this struggle for existence. Remember, we took these words straight from Thomas Malthus. Um, you can think of it as there's competition. There is competition for food, competition for habitat. There's competition to finding a mate. Um, also, individuals vary. Not everyone is the same. Um, pictured here in our butterflies, we have some red morphs and blue morphs, but in each of those morphs, there's uh, several different shades of this color. There's, of course, many different ways we can um, vary. This is simply the easiest one to put down on a piece of paper. Next, not everybody has the same number of children. The fancy words we like to use are differential reproductive success. Reproductive success refers to how many children you have, and differential just means different individuals have different numbers of children. Another important thing it, when we're talking about this is that variation is heritable. This just means that it's transmissible from parent to offspring, or that really the children are going to look like the parents. And this is something we know already. Most people look like their parents at, to at least some degree, and most people look like their siblings quite a lot. So in this example, blue butterflies are going to have blue children, and red butterflies are going to have red children. So let's talk about how all of these different things fit together. First, we have variation. The individuals in our population are different, and not everyone is the same. This is the first process that must happen for natural selection to occur. The next thing is that that variation that we see, it must be heritable. You must be able to reliably pass on that variation to your offspring. The next part is now we have differential reproduction. Some individuals are going to have more children. And if that um, variation in number of offspring is based on the physical variation present, after one generation of reproduction, now we see natural selection. This population has been selected for based simply on the different traits we see present in their, um, in their phenotype. So let's go over these conditions of natural selection again. First, we have that variation. Second, that variation is heritable. Now we have this differential reproduction. And of course, we have one generation of reproduction. So again, variation. It changes the next generation. It happens to a population and not an individual. That's the important part. 
So let's go back to our levels of biological organization. This is one of the reasons why it's important to understand these. Evolution happens at the level of the population. The problem was, before Darwin came along, people were actually looking at the level of the individual. And this is the reason why it took people so long to figure out what was happening, because we were looking at the wrong level of organization. And since we were looking at the wrong level, we were never really able to see the pattern. So this is why you need to make sure you're paying attention to what level you're looking to, because it will affect your results. So natural selection. This is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to differences in phenotype or differences in how they look. This is how descent with modification occurs. Uh, and so you might hear some people refer to it as the mechanism for evolution. So evolution by natural selection. Remember, the idea of evolution was already recognized. Darwin didn't come up with that word, but what he did come up with was evolution by natural selection. So those were Darwin's three hypotheses, but there were a couple other insights we can also gain from his work. Of course, evolution by natural selection, but he was also pointing out that variation is important, that individuals within one species are actively competing with each other for resources, and that's what causes a species to change. This is in direct opposition to ideas from essentialism, which ignored all of these differences. And Darwin's like, no, those differences are the important part. That's where evolution is happening. So now people are having to shift from ignoring all of that variation to explicitly looking at it. And the other thing Darwin pointed out was population thinking. Rather than looking at a single individual to characterize an entire species, well, we have to look at a population. We have to look at the different forms that are present and how populations vary. So what were Darwin's hypotheses and what other insights can we draw from his work?